Uh, I know that Lady Thatcher is with us this evening. The reason I know that is that I'm using this here to read my remarks from. Uh, as when I went down to, to try and get them printed off by the hotel, uh, there was a glitch in the system and it wouldn't let me have my script. And so I'm having to resort to this. Now, Lady Thatcher was a great one immediately before she spoke of causing absolute mayhem and chaos. <laughs> uh, she would always click on something, there's something wrong. She got the wrong speech. She was, the, the audience wasn't the right one for, for what she was delivering. The light wasn't right on the podium. The water wasn't in the correct place. There would always be something in order to get that adrenaline going. So I know she is sabotaging me. <laughs> um, forgive me if after 21 years working for Lady T, uh, I end up here attending a, a conference devoted to her and her achievements. It's a bit like akin to going to Busman's holiday <laughs> for me. Uh, I should tell you that Lady Thatcher was never really one for birthdays. Uh, she'd always feign not to know when one was coming up. And uh, a bit like a true lady, pretend that she didn't know how old she was. <laughs> uh, when perhaps rather ungallantly she was reminded, uh, she would reply, well, I don't feel that old. <laughs> uh, birthday or not, uh, I do know there's someone up there with the gin and tonics clinking, and Dennis will be shouting out, drink up, love, and I'll pour you the other half. Uh, I only hope the Lord has a very well-stocked bar. <laughs> uh, our speakers this weekend uh, face a formidable challenge, given the sheer amount that has been written and said about Margaret Thatcher over the last six months. And that doesn't include the three current biographies. Uh, most recently, Jonathan Aitken's a uh, colourful interpretation, a sort of my life with Margaret. Uh, Charles Moore's mammoth tome, the first volume of a, of a quite monumental work, and Robin Harris's fascinating and insightful biography, written as it is by someone who was a close advisor, collaborator and friend with, of hers for 30 years. And the very first sentence of Robin's book puts a finger on something very important with Margaret Thatcher. He writes, more perhaps than any other British Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher was made what she was by her upbringing. I believe that's right. For Margaret Thatcher was very much a product of Grantham. By the time she left here in 1943 to go to Oxford, the values and beliefs which were to shape her approach to life and ultimately to government, were already deeply rooted. Her faith, her Methodist background, moulded a belief in the virtues of hard work, personal responsibility, self-reliance, and an obligation towards others. She believed that God blessed each and every one of us with unique talents and abilities and that it was by using them that we benefited ourselves, our families, and our communities. We are not just victims of fate. Each of us, of, of us has a choice, and each of us can decide our own direction. A, a poem she was very fond of quoting perhaps puts it best. One ship sails east, and another sails west by the self-same winds that blow. It is the set of the sail, and not the gale, which determine the way they go. So, right at the heart of her approach is the self-determining individual. Not the selfish, greedy, grasping one that we've all come to see in the papers. She would have been as horrified as anybody by the, the bankers' bonuses and all of, all of the problems that we've seen with our financial system. But as Keith Joseph was later to explain it, her faith was in responsible individualism. 
Now, Margaret Thatcher's view has often been misinterpreted, uh, almost always deliberately, by her political foes, and alas, sometimes, by those on her own side. The most memorable case of this, of course, is her view of society. But as she later explained, I've never minimized the importance of society, only contested the assumption that society doesn't mean the state, it means other people. The refreshing thing about Lady T was that she said what she thought. She was a remarkably truthful person. That doesn't always make life easy for those around her. Uh, she was very demanding and expected the best. But to be fair, she also expected the best from herself. She liked to talk in terms which reflected her Grantham background. Hers were the value of the chapel and the shop and the home. She often used her experiences of the shop to illustrate economic or business points. And she was famous for applying a housewife's viewpoint to the workings of the national budget. Devotees of Agatha Christie's Miss Marple will recall that the elderly sleuth is described thus. She knows the world only through the prism of her village and its daily life. By knowing the village so thoroughly, she seems to know the world. Without exaggerating, exaggerating the point, there was a bit of that in Margaret Thatcher. Intellectuals, or at least those who like to think themselves intellectual, <laughs> would often sneer at this homely, housewifely, shopkeeper's daughterly approach to life. But she knew that she was talking in language which ordinary people understood. Being a scientist, as she would often remind you, uh, she knew that the laws of science are fixed. The laws of physics and chemistry are not altered by the size or shape of the object or task. They remain the same. Thus, she would argue, why should the laws of economics not follow the same set of rules? Why shouldn't the laws of everyday economic life in the home or in business apply equally to the economics of the nation. And of course, in essence, they do, or they should do. It's just that at some stage, government came to realize that by utilize, utilizing its size and its financial power, it could defer its responsibilities. It could pass on the consequences of its actions to its successors and pass on the cost to the next generation and to generations to come. It would be an interesting experiment, I think, if governments were legally required to balance the books at the end of their term of office. Uh, now, Lady loved to make a virtue of her frugality. We've all heard the stories about her switching off lights, uh, turning down the heating, making another meal, uh, leftovers, etc., etc. Uh, and she prided on it. Uh, there was one occasion where she was visiting President Mitterrand uh, at the Elysee Palace. She'd left office, he was still there. And the President was talking to her at the end of the conversation about how he liked to relax on a Sunday and get away from all the official paperwork. Oh, I agree, said Lady Thatcher. Uh, not, of course, that, that she did. Uh, <laughs> The president then told her that he particularly liked to visit his favorite restaurant for dinner at least twice a month on a Sunday. The only problem with this was that this particular restaurant was on the Mediterranean coast, some four to five hundred miles <laughs> south of Paris. Uh, Mitterrand told her how the cars were taken from the Elysee to the, the airport, the presidential jet would be waiting for him, they would fly down to Montpellier Airport, where there would be another motorcade waiting to whisk him along a motorway, which was miraculously empty because it had been closed several hours before, and he would arrive at his restaurant on a little bay opposite the town of Set, and sit by the waterside, enjoying 
a marvellous meal of oysters, lobsters, and particularly he liked, I can't remember what they were, these little game birds, which he particularly liked and enjoyed during the season. And being president of France, he also managed to enjoy them out of the season <laughs> as well. Uh, he would sit there and enjoy this meal, with, washed down with a cool montrachet, and as he said, it's always wonderful to have a beautiful woman come with me. Uh, this, I would point out, was very rarely Madame Mitterrand. <laughs> <laughs> At exactly 15, 8, 10, 15, the President would write on his table and begin his journey back to Paris. One of the joys of office, he declared. It's quite clear from Mrs. Hatcher's face, the horrified, disapproving <laughs> scowl she had, that she was absolutely appalled at the cost of all this. And, and really had nothing to say at this point. To which the President said, what do you like to do on a Sunday evening? And she replied, Dennis and I have Bovril on toast. <laughs> government, uh, Margaret Thatcher maintained, a, 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 I think, a healthy suspicion of the state. She was an outsider on the inside. Uh, she once famously, a story about her having lunch when she was Secretary of State with the Chairman of an Educational Authority. And at the time, they were closing a particularly uh, popular grammar school in this, in, in this constituency. Uh, and the Chairman of the Authority was against it but had been outvoted. But he used his privilege, which he was allowed, to go and talk to the Secretary of State. And so he invited her to lunch at the Oxford and Cambridge Club. And they sat and had lunch. And the first thing she did was give him her home telephone number. And she said, always phone me on that number. Then they can't interfere. <laughs> and she said, do you realize that at this very moment, your officials are talking to my officials about what we're discussing? and trying to work out how they can stop us. And that was her view of much of government. She believed the state needed to be strong, but she also believed that it needed to be limited. She believed that it should be the servant, not the master, the custodian, not the collaborator, the umpire, not the player. She believed that states, societies, and economies that allow individuals to flourish themselves also flourish. Those which dwarf, crush, distort, manipulate and ignore them cannot progress. So freedom of the individual stood at the very centre of her creed. And whether at home or abroad, she was not afraid to say it. Often, much when she was abroad, much to the horror of the Foreign Office, but she, she always liked to tweak the noses of the foreign office. She was very amused by a story she was once told about a, a man who was late for a meeting uh, at the foreign office, and he was rushing down Whitehall from Trafalgar Square uh, in a terrible panic, and he stopped a policeman halfway down, and he said, officer, officer, I'm terribly sorry, can you tell me which side the foreign office is on? And the, and the policeman looked at him and said, well, of course, sir, it's not ours. <laughs> when she was travelling around the world, uh, she used to talk about freedom. And many of these concept, concepts to, were not known to her audiences. Uh, and she had to say, freedom is not just about the right to vote. Freedom is a melding of democracy, coupled with free enterprise, under a rule of law, as she used to call it, a tripod. Now, at this point when she was speaking, her advisers would often uh, look at their feet uh, as she insisted on illustrating the tripod, the tripod point by making repeated gestures around the room. <laughs> No matter how much one tried to explain to her, it might possibly be misinterpreted, uh, she would not be persuaded to desist. <laughs> Lady T knew that freedom's victory was never absolute, that the battle of ideas had to be fought over and over again. 
and that complacency and weakness could undermine all that had been hard won. Tennyson wrote of our country, a land of settled government, a land of just and old renown, where freedom slowly broadens down from precedent to precedent. When the Freedom Association was founded back in the 1970s, it was not clear that those freedoms would continue to broaden down. But thank goodness there were a few who believed that the customs and practices of our people, long honed and tested by history, needed defending. Ladies and gentlemen, beliefs matter. If our, it is our beliefs which shape our policies and our laws, our beliefs which create the framework for the government of our nation, our beliefs which protect the individual from the overmighty. As Margaret Thatcher often said, without beliefs, we have no stars to steer by. So please, continue to hold your beliefs strong. Continue to share them and expand them. Continue to challenge those who would erode and replace them. And in remembrance of Margaret Thatcher, in the words she herself chose for her own heraldic motto, cherish freedom. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah.